I'll make a start. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to session 15 of the SCTS Foundation Doctor Academy teaching program. I'm very pleased to be joined um, by Mr. Luke Rogers, who's an SD7 in cardiothoracic surgery in the Southwest. And tonight he'll be talking to us about preoperative assessment in cardiac surgery. We're very grateful for his time. Without further delay, over to you, Luke. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, no, thank you for um, all of you tuning in and joining. Um, I know most of you would have been otherwise out trick or treating, um, trying to get some extra sweets. I know we've had a few knock at the doors already. Um, but this, um, so this is about preoperative assessment in cardiac surgery. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty all encompassing and it's pretty, it's quite a large topic that covers quite a lot. Um, and it's, and it's not to the majority of surgeons um that inspiring but what so what i've tried to do is i've tried to answer these learning objectives which were kindly provided um, and i've also tried to introduce some things that i think will just be a little bit more interesting and maybe things that come up quite frequently in your sort of clinical practice um but but ultimately just to give you a bit of a background to to the processes and, and what it actually entails um, so I think first of all, what what do you know? Um, I'm expecting this sort of a response um, to this to this question, because um, I'm sure you're all sat in front of your computers paying lots of attention. Um, but what I'd actually all like you to do, if you can, and there's no way of testing this, but it, the, I will bring um, notes to it um, later on in the presentation, is just try and take a screenshot of that Sligo of that QR code on your phones. Um, and that will will bring up some questions um, throughout the presentation, um, which you can get back to, and I can see on my phone um, how well it's going on. I will. It is that as a bit of a test uh, on my part, um, just to see how it works and um, if it's if it's worth using. So I've got that loaded on my side, um, and if any of you can join in or on that qr code then that'd be brilliant it should just come straight up i've put a few qr codes in throughout the rest of the presentation um to um to resources that you might find helpful sort of later on or to, to go back and have a look at um, but without further ado we'll we'll get cracking so um i was asked to basically give a bit of an overview of the preoperative pathway um to sort of underpin the perioperative uh, the preoperative assessment um, and, and this basically is a nice diagram that outlines it at all, uh, outlines at all. Um, and it basically comes through from an elective setting and an urgent setting and an emergency setting. So the majority of referrals um, are still in the elective setting. Um, and so therefore a referral will come through um, from a consultant cardiologist um, to either a consultant cardiac surgeon or to a pool, um, depending on how it works in your trust. Um, and then from that point on, they'll be booked into um, a face to face clinic appointment, usually to meet the consultant and to discuss um, what we're going to outline in this presentation. Um, what makes cardiac surgery um, a little bit trickier um, in terms of the preoperative assessment in most cases is that a lot of um, the patients around 30 percent, according to the SCTS Blue Book, um, are actually urgent inpatients. So those are referrals from our cardiology colleagues in our hospital and uh, local feeding hospitals where they've taken an urgent referral for somebody who's had an ACS or has had unstable angina or has had incidentally found to have three vessel disease or acute, uh, acute aortic stenosis or um, regurgitation. And they've had to then stay in hospital. Um, now that's quite a big proportion certainly compared to a lot of other specialties and that impacts on how uh, the preoperative assessment is delivered um, and I would argue that we're not as good certainly in the trust that I've worked and, and from the people I've discussed with is we're not very good at focusing um, on the, the preoperative assessment in those in those patients that are referred urgently. Obviously for any of those emergencies that come that are referred through directly Preoperative assessment is non-existent. You get some form of an imaging and then the emergency takes precedence and you basically deal with the operation and the consequences 
as you can. Um, some things are helpful, some things are others, um, and you get on, on, on route to the operating theatre almost, um, but in the vast majority of cases, it, it's very different. We'll come back to that um, pathway a little bit later on, um, but I just wanted to emphasise one other point um, from this, and that's how the patient population is changing throughout this time. So the SCTS produce an, a, a blue book, which is basically a national audit of the patients that we operate on in cardiac surgery, where they get operated on, what their demographics are, how risky they are um, for operations um, and the mortality. And it's quite clear to see that over the years, although the number of cardiac surgical operations are, uh, are falling, the complexity of those procedures are, is increasing, although we are doing less redo stenotomies. Um, and the, the risk profile of the patients is also increasing. So now 40% of our patients are over the age of 70 and 11% of our patients are over the age of 80, which if you were to look back to the last blue book, you, basically nobody would be operated on over the age of 80. Um, and mortality, despite those um, age demographics, has continued to improve. Um, and, that, and the surgery hasn't really changed in that time. So a lot of that is due to the fact that we are managing these patients throughout their perioperative pathway and procedure in a much um, in, in, a, in a much more thorough and dedicated manner, and that's having the out, the improvement on their on their outcome. Um, in notes of uh, the eighty four year olds, um, some of you may know. I know recently we've operated on an eighty four year old gentleman with an acute aortic dissection, and he flew through. Um, and uh, I don't know if any of you know um, DeBakey, but he had an aortic dissection repair at 96. So if, if an individual is fit, their age is, is less important, but it's the assessment of that fitness um, that is sort of key to the preoperative assessment. So that brings me on to sort of the, the main reasons that we run a preoperative assessment. And arguably the two key reasons are to identify the indication for surgery. So does, does the patient that you're seeing in front of you need an operation? And then their operability. So is that patient fit enough for the operation that is required? Um, you need more information than um, just seeing a patient to be able to determine that. Um, and you have to work through um, those processes with the patient. And so it also forms a part of um, an exchange of information and a discussion for the first time, which is much easier in the outpatient setting for the elective referrals than it is in, um, in it, certainly in an emergency procedure, but also in, in, in an urgent operation as well. Um, and then there is an increasing prevalence and, and uptake of enhanced recovery after surgery, which some of you will probably know from other surgical specialties. It was first advocated in colorectal surgery. Um, and then cardiac surgery, arguably, has been a little bit slow because of the nature of the operation um, to, to take up enhanced recovery. Um, but the importance of that is built into a preoperative assessment because some of those interventions occur during that preoperative stage. Um, and then run throughout the rest of the perioperative um, pathway. And then ultimately, it boils down to point five here, which is, is the proposed operation the best approach for this patient? Um, and that's because increasingly there are non-invasive or more non-invasive techniques available. Um, PCI is obviously the big one, TAVI for surgical aortic valve replacement. Um, but it's also worth not forgetting that best medical therapy is increasingly being shown to be better than PCI in most circumstances, or at least equivalent. Um, and, and so you need to think about all of those approaches. Just because the cardiologist has referred them that individual to you for surgical consideration, it doesn't mean necessarily that that patient needs an operation. And all of that is also underpinned by the multidisciplinary team approach and the heart team, where you'll have regular MDTs with these colleagues and discussions about these facts. Um, but to be able to have those discussions, you need to be able to know what that patient needs and why they need it, and also how you make an assessment of that individual's fitness. So we'll go over sort of a brief overview, sorry, a brief overview um, of the indications for surgery. This is quite expansive within cardiac surgery, um, although some of our surgical um, uh, colleagues will tell us that we don't do 
we only do two operations in cardiac surgery. That's not strictly true. Um, and and so th there is there is quite a breadth in the indications for cardiac surgery, not just in terms of coronary artery bypass grafting, but aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis, mitral disease, tricuspid valve disease, and the major and major aortic pathologies. So although it is uh, is a finite population, those those indications vary quite a lot um, um, within those populations, and also increasing uh, increasingly um, atrial fibrillation. Um, is 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 treated with a surgical approach as well. So to understand and to start being able to talk about the indications for surgery with your colleagues and with cardiologists, you need to first understand these two um, diagrams. Uh, these are taken from any of the EACS guidelines that you can find them online, and some of them, some of you will already be aware of them from from other um, resources because. It is, it's, it's a generic sort of expectation on the classes of recommendation. So class, a class one recommendation is something that you should be doing or um, is recommended. Um, and then the level of evidence basically states what is the evidence that is underpinning that, that recommendation. So the highest level of evidence is from uh, multiple randomized clinical trials. Um, and they may be um, summarized in a recent meta-analysis, and that forms your sort of class 1A um, evidence base. Um, as you go down the levels of evidence, you effectively go down to sort of level C, which is effectively anecdotal evidence where there isn't very much published research out there, um, and the rigorousness of, of that is can't be, can't really be questioned um, and it hasn't yet been tested in a randomized controlled trial. So we'll just, um, I've, I've basically recreated those tables um, for indications um, for cardiac surgery. Um, there's quite a lot of information on all of them and they're all taken from the ESC and EACS guidelines for myocardial revascularization and the management of valvular heart disease and the diagnosis and treatment of aortic disease. Now, all of those papers are out there on, on, the, on the internet, and I would advise you all, particularly if you're going into your registrar jobs, and uh, to be aware of them, to know where to find them, and to, to start learning what it is um, that, that makes these sort of dimensions. Just to take you through coronary artery bypass grafting, for example, we can see here that it's class one indicated in three vessel disease. What I'm referring to there is that the atherosclerosis that is um, causing a, a coronary artery disease is occurring in three of those vessels. So that may be the left anterior descending, it may be the right coronary artery, the left circumflex artery or the obtuse marginals. But those are those are the specifications, and then you can see the level of evidence for that is an as an A, and you can work down the pathway to those which are considered. So for coronary artery bypass grafting, there isn't any that are considered, but then you can come to maybe consider, which is, for example, one vessel disease in the proximal, uh, which is without proximal LAD. So that would be either mid or distal LAD or an entirely different vessel, the right coronary artery, for example. Um, what I haven't shown here is that when particularly when you're looking at for this in relation to coronary artery bypass grafting and also in relation to um, severe aortic stenosis is you need to also have a bit of a mental map of what the indications for PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, and what the indications for TAVI, transcatheter aortic valve implantation are. Because you will see that for, for one vessel disease without proximal LAD, for example, in cardiac surgery, we've got an indication which suggests we should maybe con be considering that. But if you don't know that in PCI, that it's a class one indication for a stent, then you're going to you're not going to be able to have a conversation with a consultant cardiologist that might be discussing this with you um, in the heart in the MDT heart team. So you although you need to be aware of the indications for surgery, it's also important that you're aware um, of the indications for that the alternative therapies. More on um, that just being important for um, your, the, the conversations you have. That's that's sort of key and and 
underpins the conversation that you are going to have with the patient. Because if you can't explain the indications for the alternative options that are that are available to that patient, then you, you're not going to be in a, in a very good position to um, talk about the options that are available and, and the recommendations over why an individual should choose one or the other. Um, I've carried on through these slides of this here, we took, we're looking at mitral valve disease um, on the left and also the ascending aorta. So it's, it's clear from on this um, slide that the indications or the level of evidence isn't as strong as it is in coronary artery bypass grafting and aortic valve um, replacement. And that's basically because CABG is probably one of the most um, researched operations that there is, if not the most operation uh, researched in the world. Um, but you've still got a lot of evidence for the vast majority of cardiac surgical procedures, which if you were to compare it to other surgical specialties is, is surprisingly untrue in the majority of operations that we perform on people or that surgeons perform on people. Um, you can refer back to these um, at any point. Um, they're basically just reiterating the, the same point. Um, what I forgot to mention earlier, actually, um, on the class three recommendation, which was the red one at the bottom, it's basically don't do it. Um, the, you, I think you'd be you'd be hard pressed to find surgeons, certainly in the UK, that would do anything with a class three indication because it's advised against. Um, and so, if you find yourself in that particular situation, it's probably worth um, finding out. Um, what the thinking is, or, or you've probably missed something to explain that. Um, right, so just before we carry on with determining operability, I'm just going to see if any of you can see the first question on Slido. So I've activated um, the first the first question, and it doesn't look like there's any of you on there. So I'll give it 30 seconds to see if any of you managed to actually find that QR code and, and log in. Um, we have some responses, that's positive. So yeah, the question is, which of the following is a non-modifiable risk factor? Um, and if you can all just get onto Slido, we'll do, we'll do two questions. So the more the merrier, um, I'm, I'm not gonna keep the, re the results. Um, it's mainly just testing the technology and my ability to use it, <laughs> um, as opposed to testing your guys' knowledge. But that's, so we got five responses. Uh, how many of the are I on? Okay, so it looks like there's 14. Okay. We'll stick with we'll stick with the we'll stick with five because I think I've given you a bit of time. So yeah, I'll show the answer on that one. Um, and you were all spot on. So good work. Um we'll go on to the next question, which should be live now. I uh, know something went wrong. Yep, yeah, so that, that one should be live now. And that question is, what studies is the highest level of evidence derived from? And this just refers back to the first slide in indications for surgery as to what, um, what you think is, is sort of underpinning the, the evidence. Okay, yeah, we'll take that. So six of you got that answer, and you got it spot on. Yeah, okay. So we went. There's only a couple more questions, but we'll we'll come to them um, a bit later on. So that that deals with a brief overview of sort of the indications for surgery, um, and you can delve into that. And um, I've put the references within um, the slides, which I think are going to be available to you. Um, so you can have a look at that a bit later on and you just need to familiarize yourself with those indications. But once you've so once you've determined that the, the patient has an indication for surgery, you then need to determine whether that's the best thing for them. So the, the operability um, and that starts um, simply with the things you're probably well accustomed to now. A history is the first place. So. Um, Demographics, risk factors, non-modifiable, uh, modifiable, as you've already alluded to, 
cardiovascular and respiratory systems are the focus. So you, you have to assess the severity of the symptoms to be able to grade where they are um, on the New York Heart Association and Canadian uh, Cardiovascular Society grades, which I'll, 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 I'll come to a little bit later on. You then also want to start trying to be able to quantify the risk of an operation. So that it's in, therefore important to identify any uh, extra cardiac extra cardiac arteriopathy, so peripheral, peripheral vascular disease, previous cerebral vascular events, um, but also the main system. So do they have any kidney issues? Do they have any liver issues? Are you going to have difficulty getting a TOE in if you're going to be doing a valve replacement? Are they anemic? Um, do they have uncontrolled diabetes that's going to increase their risk of wound infection? Um, are there any hematological um, risks that make uh, heparinizing somebody challenging or, or being able to put them on the heart-lung machine um, worrying. Nutrition is probably something that's overlooked quite a lot and I'll, I'll speak to, uh, a little bit later on in more but that's probably something that we don't we're not very good at assessing um, based on their history how much somebody eats whether they're of good weight besides obviously weighing them um, and then other things like the medications so what antiplatelets on, what anticoagulants on, do they take the oral contraceptive pill, that increases the risk of thrombosis, but it's also then about planning what they're going to do about those medications when they come in for their operation. So ideally, you don't want somebody to be taking warfarin before they have a heart operation because the risk of bleeding goes up through the roof. Yes, we do it if they're, if it's an emergency, but if you're, if you're in the elective setting, you should be able to plan that they stop the war from five days before their admission. And if they need to be bridged or they need to come in for a heparin infusion, then, then you can organise that. It's also important um, to get a little bit about their religious and cultural beliefs. There may be things um, like the Jehovah's Witness population where they don't want blood products. Now that's important to know before the operation because there's a high chance that they may well need blood products. And, um, and within the Jehovah's Witnesses community, there's varying degrees of what they accept and what they don't accept. And you can't make assumptions about that. You've got to have it um, mapped out and laid out. And they're often very aware of the, um, of the processes and, and what is and what fits with their beliefs and what doesn't. Um, so you need to be familiar with that so that you can explain that to them in, in the full um, and then take that into account then going forward with the planning um, for surgery. The other thing that's probably a big part, again, which is similar to nutrition, which we're probably not very good at assessing in, in cardiac surgery is frailty. Um, it, we, we all, I would think, um, think we can assess somebody's frailty from the sort of the end of the breadogram um, and we have an idea of what frailty looks like um, but it's quite difficult to quantify um, and, and put down on paper which is increasingly important when you're doing a pre-operative assessment that might be four or six weeks before that operation and um, so that's something to think about there are indexes the Rockwood index um, is one which is reasonably straightforward and you could include into your into your preoperative assessment uh, and then there's quite a lot of ongoing work in how to quantify this the cardiologists are ahead of the game in terms of they've been much um, quicker to sort of assess frailty particularly in the um, in the tabby population um, and there's a lot of research out there that you can sort of read around um, if you desire um, but just going back to sort of the cardinal signs and symptoms for uh, cardiovascular disease and um, we'll come to the New York Health Association classification um, is that still blank on your screen so I'm just going to try that again there we go um, and, and this is basically what it is interestingly this this was devised um, in about 1921 uh, so it, it's not really changed very much um, and it's probably due um, for for uh, uh, at, at least a bit of a review to see if it's still consistent but it's pretty straightforward the New York Health Association so it's basically one to four or eight it was a b c d e in the in its originality um, and d basically equates to not being able to do the activities of daily living without distress and pain on rest and a is being able to do everything that should they should choose the Canadian Cardiovascular Society is um a little bit all, 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 a little bit more all encompassing. It has a bit more depth in their descriptions, and it, again, it grades it from one to four. Um, I've highlighted in red the key sort of words, um, which are basically ordinary physical uh, 
um, activity, a slight limitation, marked limitation, and then symptoms of rest. And that then allows you to classify um, angina and heart failure symptoms in somebody who's presenting to you um, in clinic through your history and to sort of find out where you are with things. You then move on to um, your examination. Um, and again, the key examination here is of your cardiovascular and your respiratory system. I'm not going to go through the details of all of those. Um, the vast majority of you, I think, have, are in your F1 and F2 years. So you're probably doing these far more frequently than I am. Um, and if not, you can always pick up a good book, the uh, the uh, Mc, McLeod's book of cardiovascular examination covers all of this. Um, but it's basically observation of the patient and looking for signs starting at the fingertips, come from head to toe, and then you palpate, and then you auscultate, and that would be obviously listening to your to your four areas for, for murmurs. Um, you also then need to pay particular attention to the operative side, so particularly the chest, do they have any chest wall deformities, is anything going to make the stenotomy a little bit more challenging? If they have got a significant chest wall deformity, and um, that might push you to um, arrange in a, another investigation, which you might not routinely do, um, for somebody such as a CT. Um, and then you also need to start thinking about your conduits. So if you're doing bypass surgery, where are you going to get your conduit from to be able to perform those, those bypasses? You take the radial artery, you're obviously going to take a mammary um, from one side of the chest or potentially both. Um, you can take the saphenous vein from the leg or the, even the short saphenous sometimes. But you need to, so you need to be able to see those um, operative sites to be able to start determining your operative plan and also to start thinking about any further investigations you might need to do to assist you um, in, 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 the, in, in that planning of the operation. And then, as I've said here, at the end of the bedogram, I alluded it to it in the history, and I think it's it's important that you see every patient. The, the, the That marker of frailty is something that everybody can, everybody sort of knows what it is when they see the patient. Um, or they know what the patient that's high risk looks like, um, but there's a lot of there are a lot of minutiae within the preoperative assessment that isn't covered by any tests and isn't even covered by any of the risk stratification tools, um, and it's and it's just on your experience over time and what you've seen and how you've seen it and how things have played out that leads you to think ah oh, no so although on paper this sounds this sounds pretty good actually this is going to be riskier than, um, than, it, than, it, than, it's, than it suggests. And that's important because you have to then be able to um, relay that information to, to, the, to the patient, to the individual that's going through that operation. Because at the end of the day, it's not a risk for the surgeon. It's not like um, airline pilots where if, uh, if we make a mistake or things go badly, we go, we go down with the plane. Surgery, we don't we don't and we don't take on any of that risk whatsoever so it's if you are recognizing those pilot signs and picking up on those things you need to be, then be able to articulate that back to the patient to to give them a, a, the ability to make a, a fully informed um decision your yeah investigations i've, I've broadly fit them into two groups here the bedside tests, which you get on basically every patient, and you will probably be um, responsible for requesting in most cases, um, and uh, and then imaging tests, which um, you are ordering for a particular purpose. I'm not going to dwell on them um, too much, and we'll cover a few little bits uh, in some of the tests. But the important thing in in terms of the imaging is you need to be thinking back to your indications of surgery. So what do I need or what haven't I got to be able to support um, or refute the, the reason that, that this patient has been referred to me? And if I'm going to be doing an operation for one thing, um, you would prefer to know that you don't need to do another operation at the same time, because if you have to do another operation a month or two later for a different reason, you're going to look pretty silly. So things like a coronary angiogram in the vast majority of people um, that are undergoing cardiac surgery for a different reason for bypass surgery will have a coronary angiogram. If they're young and being referred for uh, mitral valve, say, they might have a CT coronary angiogram, um, which fine if it demonstrates no uh, significant lesions, then that's fine. You can you can crack on with your operation, but it might be that actually that that identifies 
um, a lesion which is suspicious and therefore you want a coronary angiogram to be able to determine whether you're going to have to do a coronary artery bypass graft at the same time. And you'd much rather know about that upfront. Things like the stress echo and the exercise tolerance test link directly back into your indications for surgery as in uh, th these patients may be asymptomatic or they may not fit the criteria of severe aortic stenosis quite perfectly and so you need some additional tests to support your indication and it's important to get those tests done to support that indication because it's the patient that's going to be taking a risk with the operation and if you haven't been able to demonstrate that they needed that operation and then something bad happens you're going to be in a bit of a sticky situation um so we'll just go on to the electrocardiogram. I'm not sure why my slides keep coming up on blank. I don't know if it's affecting you guys, but um, that's the reason I'm, if, if, if it's not coming up blank on your screen, the reason I'm flicking is because it is coming up blank on my screen as I move between slides. So you just have to bear with me with that, I'm afraid. Um, we're not going to talk too much about the ECG, but I just thought I'd mix it up a little bit. Otherwise, it can be a little bit dry. But so this is, this is an ECG, as I'm sure you're all aware, but it's important to, to try and think about this in terms of the, the locations of what it's looking at in the heart. And, and that's why I think this is quite a nice um, figure to be able to look at the anterior leads, the lateral leads and the inferior leads, because that gives you an indication for what you might have to do. Now, albeit in the vast majority of cases, we are not dealing with um, acute coronary syndromes because they go to the cath lab um, but they go to the cath lab and if they found if they're found to have three vessel disease they may well come back to us um, and therefore it's it's good for us to be able to look at their ECGs and go yeah okay so they came in with ST elevation in the inferior leads so they had uh, a disease in the right coronary artery which has now been stented um, so you check the coronary angiogram and you can see that the stents are nicely patent and you're like, brilliant, I don't need to do anything about that. But looking down on the left side of the system, they've got disease there. They didn't have any uh, ST changes or T-wave inversion, but that's the focus of this operation. And you need to be able to spot these things on the ward when you're starting to look after cardiothoracic surgical patients, because this happens pre-op, it happens post-op, um, and it's just, it's, it's just the, the necessary information. The next thing is cardiac axis. So this tells you a little bit about how the ventricles of the heart. Um, I've stuck these again on with William and Marrow. I ideally would have liked them the other way around because it fits better, William and Narrow. Um, but they're basically ways of remembering where you get the changes in V1 and V6 and what that relates to in terms of the bundle branch block. Um, and also and also hypertrophy is something that you can see in your QRS complex. Um, I've stuck these on here because I think the things that people sometimes get mixed up or struggle with um, and they're quite easy diagrams to 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 take that from and the next thing that's quite common and will be more important particularly after um somebody's had a, a heart operation aortic valve um in particular is heart block so one of our concerns both in those patients that have surgical aortic valve replacement and TAVI, is that there is an increased rate of pacemaker, certainly if you were to compare it to coronary artery bypass grafting alone. Um, first degree heart block, we don't intervene with. You might, if it's a prolonged uh, PR interval, um, you may want to stop or reduce their beta blocker dose. Um, but then type two and AV block, you're gonna be having a chat with your cardiologist relatively early in their post-operative period, because this generally, you generally notice this almost from the, the immediate um, post-operative period, but they're likely to need a pacemaker before they go home. And you want to get the cardiologist on site um, in terms of planning that, although they won't generally insert any pacemaker until sort of five to seven days post-operatively, because there is still a chance that it settles down and it's all due to just the inflammation of surgery. Um, I then thought I'd go through a few slides on echocardiogram, uh, just transthoracic, and this is mainly just to uh, just to review a little bit about the the pictures, so that it's not um, it's not so much of a surprise when you see these things um, for the first time. So parasternal long axis view, so the probe's on the front of the chest, it's running parallel to the sternum, um, and you the first thing you see is what is anatomically the most anterior, which is the right ventricle. Um, and this this just gives a nice picture um, of, of what it is you're looking at, and it's nicely labelled, which is why I've kept it in. 
Um, and I'll also flick through the other slides. So again, this is parasternal short axis. So this is, again, the probe in the same position, but the probe now is at 90 degrees um, and it's cutting through at a different angle to cut a to cut across the ventricles and you your view changes then depending on the level that you're looking at so it gives you a lovely picture of the aortic valve um which you could you you would be able to put a colored doppler flow on potentially and see a central jet although if you want to see a regurgitant flow it's much better in your parasternal long axis um, and it also gives you a view that sort of the mouth view um of the mitral valve um if you would if you um slide down slightly with your probe um, I haven't gone through transesophageal echo, but again, there's a lot of information on the on the internet, um, and I, and that's actually probably even more pertinent to to you as um, aspiring surgeons because those are the images you're going to see um, intraoperatively. Um, so these images you're going to see and you're going to look at preoperatively in your assessment to, to figure out what you need to do with the operation and what the risks are. Um, but then you also need to know about TOE so that when your cardiology and anaesthetic colleagues are looking at the TOE to see if you've done a good job with the valve, that you um, can appreciate and understand the images that they're showing you at that time. Uh, this is an apical two chamber, as you can see, it's looking at the left ventricle um, closest to the probe and the left atrium posteriorly, which is your giveaway for if you're looking at a trans uh, transesophageal echo is that picture is basically in, in reverse. So in a transesophageal echo, the echo probe goes down your esophagus and the atrium is, is at the front of the probe. So the atrium would be seen here as opposed to furthest away from the probe. And that's one of the clues um, to, to differentiate what you're looking at if, uh, if somebody's trying to quiz you or catch you out. Apical three chamber view is just including um, the aortic valve um, as you can see here, and they're just nice labelled pictures just to give you something else to look at. Um, we'll move on to the coronary angiogram. Um, actually, it's still not coming up. So first things first, you're looking at the um, arches of the heart. Um, so this obviously, your ostea for the coronary arches come off um, the side the level of the sinotubular junctions in the aortic root and give off your left main artery which branches into your slow complex artery and your left anterior descending artery which runs in the intraventricular septum on the anterior and then on the right you've got your right coronary artery which um, branches around in a bit of a c shape um, and gives off the posterior descending artery um, down the posterior interventricular groove but it also gives that acute marginal which comes off um nicely on the acute margin of the heart um, and the reason that image is important is because whenever you're looking at coronary angiograms that's the sort of you need to be so able to sort of manipulate that image in your in your head to sort of interpret and understand what you're looking at so this is obviously um two angiogram pictures um of the coronary arteries you can see the this is an rao caudal projection uh, of the left coronary circulation you have got your circumflex artery coming down here. You've got your left anterior descending artery coming down here. It goes to the apex. It often gives off a little snake um, uh, snake uh, tongue. Um, and the key thing is it gives off these septal branches, which are at 90 degrees um, to the LAD. And that's your, give, that's your marker for, for identifying the LAD. You can also see a diagonal. Um, which is always high in the angiogram. So your LAD is never the highest artery. Uh, a diagonal is always up there. And then on the next image, you can see here, remembering that C shape, um, this is an LAO cranial projection of the right coronary system. Um, you can see the branch going down and it gives off a PDA down here. Um, what you also need to be able to do um, is identify which is an RAO and which is an LAO. And there's a few ways of, or a little hints and tips that you can remember to do this. Um, but they basically, where, if, the, if the right coronary artery makes a right angle, as it does here, then it's an RAO view. Uh, sorry, it's an LAO view. <laughs> um, and it also means that the ribs, um, uh, on, on, sorry, the ribs are on the left and the spine is on the right. So an LAO view is, is that sort of trajectory there. And then the flip side is true for the RAO. So ribs on right. So you can see the ribs coming off here 
and that means that it's an RAO view of that system there. Cranial and caudal um, is basically differentiated by the diaphragm. So you can't see any diaphragm in this projection here, so it's likely to be caudal. Um, and in this view here, it's likely to be cranial because, oh, sorry, because you've got uh, the diaphragm coming in on the, in the lower portion there. Here you can see some stenoses. So these are quite critical um, and they're critical in the uh, mid right coronary artery here. Yeah, that is coming up on your screen. Um, and obviously at the left main stem here before it bifurcates. Um, and that would be something that if they were in the same patient, you'd be a little bit worried about and um, they're not. So you don't need to worry too much. Um, and then these are the projections. So this is all. Um, so again, it's a cranial view. You can see that you've got the diaphragm coming into coming into the view, um, and it's likely to be taken with the right radial. You can't see any catheter. That's another trick. You can tell where the catheter, where the projection was taken from. This is the catheter that they're using, um, and it comes all the way around the aortic arch and back through, um, and that tells you that they've they've cannulated the femoral artery and, and passed the wire up that way. Just a little overview of the hints and tips um, because it's easier to see them together. So the clues to the LAO, angulation, spine on the right, and the clues to the REO um, angulation there. So they, and those are the those are the little tips that you need to remember to be able to describe the, the angiogram. Um, but you'll see lots of them in your practice and it becomes sort of second nature. It becomes so second nature, however, that you, you'll, you still need to go back and figure out how to determine whether it's an RAO, an LAO or a PA, because you will get tested on. Um, so then you say so you've got through the process of having those investigations and you have reviewed them. Um, and then you need to basically be able to inform your decision and, and conversation with the patient. And that's through risk stratification. So the ASA grade, I'm sure many of you will know, but you can also follow these QR codes to take you to the STS score and the Euro 2 score. And we'll come across, we'll come over them in a little bit more. Um, and the syntax score. Basically, the Euro 2 score, and I've taken these pictures because I've downloaded the app on my phone. Um, it's come up reasonably well. You can see them, I think. So age gender, uh, creatinine, previous cardiac surgery, all the regular um, risk factors that you would expect. And then the type of procedure that you are planning to do and how you are planning to do it, whether it's an urgent emergency or a salvage procedure. And you basically plug each of those patient factors, cardiac factors, operative factors into the calculator, and it gives you a number. The vast majority of people, it won't be much more than 2%. If you're starting to look at 5%, you're, you're higher. But you also need to remember that there are uh, quite a number of comorbidities and things that aren't um, encompassed by, by this uh, score, particularly frailty and nutrition and liver disease. Uh, the syntax score is something that I think very few cardiac surgeons will ever calculate because it's exceptionally complicated. Um, and even most of the cardiologists that I've spoken to um, only say they have ever calculated it a few times. Um, and the reason is because there's there's lots of things to fill out and and to put in to, to get your number. To all intents and purposes, this is the information you need to know. And that QR code will take you to the online score so you can have a play around um, and calculate in that score. But basically anybody less than 22 is, is a low syntax score. And the reason that's important is because if you know the PCI indications for um, intervention that generally favors those with a low syntax score anything medium or high which is basically over 22 generally favors coronary artery bypass grafting in almost all circumstances then we come on to another topic and i'll say i'm conscious of time but i'll start i'll try to to, to get through this as sufficiently as possible and um, hopefully we have a little bit of of wiggle room and um, because you could do a whole presentation on enhanced recovery yourself um, and for this sort of presentation um, it's basically about uh, small interventions that individually change outcomes very don't in, don't have an impact on, on outcomes on clinical outcomes but cumulatively um, result in an improvement in clinical outcomes it's the whole sort of sky 
um, team cycling marginal gains theory. Um, and in and it starts in your preoperative assessment. So these are the, um, the key factors that have been brought out of ERAS to start thinking about in preoperative assessment. So HbA1c stratification, basically, if anybody's not got HbA1c less than 6.5, you need to optimize their um, diabetic medications. The vast majority of people that have cardiac disease will have diabetes. There'll also be around 10% of people that are having have been referred for cardiac surgery that don't yet know they're diabetic. So you'll probably identify it on their HbA1c for the first time. And if you've got the time, you need to get them to get them to see their diabetic team and get them started on the appropriate therapy in advance of their surgery, uh, because that is shown to reduce postoperative complications, particularly deep sternal wound infection, but also ischemic events. Um, the measurement of albumin and nutritional deficiency are two which increase the risk of morbidity and mortality, um, and both can be improved with um, oral nutritional supplements in that seven to ten, ten, re, seven to ten day region before their surgery. Um, although there's no evidence that has yet been published in specifically in cardiac surgery trials, and that is the nature of some ongoing work and plans for uh, clinical trials going forward. Um, there's the whole mandate of nil by mouth from midnight, which is rife in cardiac surgery, generally because our lists change all the time. And if you are cancelling patients because they've had breakfast, it's annoying um, for everybody involved. So the vast majority of patients will be kept nil by mouth, whether they're first or second on the list. Um, but actually, it's shown that we can give people a light meal. Uh, six hours before an operation and clear fluids up to two hours operation the challenge there is getting buy-in from your your colleagues um to to say that that is acceptable and can be done and again there is no cardiac trials to evidence that that's all come from other surgical specialties that sort of feeds into this complex carbohydrate drink um which again there's one trial which didn't didn't demonstrate any harm um, but it's something that hasn't yet really taken off in most of the cardiac centers that I've worked in, but it's certainly an area that can be improved. And then the patient engagement tools and the prehabilitation and the smoking sensation, they basically work into your preoperative assessment consultation anyway, um, to try and stop them smoking and drinking ideally both a month before their operation, because we know that that improves post-operative or reduces the risk of post-operative outcome, poor outcomes and prehabilitation. That's, there's, again, there's no trials yet in cardiac surgery, but that's there's quite a bit of work going on to getting an NHL grant together for that. Um, and this is all information that you that informs your discussion with the patient um, the first time you see them. Hopefully, if that's not enough, you then get to the situation where you, in your mind, know what that patient needs and knows what the best um, operation and procedure for that patient is. Um, and then it's a case of discussing that with the patient and, and, and finding out what they want. Um, and then you've got to be able to talk and articulate all of that information, the risk, the benefits and um, the alternatives, what the consequences of doing nothing is um, to the patient to be able to make them make an informed decision and get them through that consent process, which will probably happen at a later date. But the questions will start on the back of this preoperative assessment. Um, you need to be able to state the PCI is a, it's a quicker recovery. There is no doubt that you can have stents and you will be out of hospital far sooner than any operation, any cardiac operation anyway. Um, but there is an increased risk of reoperation. Um, there's no improvement in survival that has yet been demonstrated unless you're talking about an acute ACS. Um, but surgery is riskier. It uh, debilitates people for a much longer period of time. And people are looking at between three and six months of recovery to get over that operation. Um, so you really have to have a chat about that, about that and to find out what it is that they want and, uh, and are happy with. Which then brings me in full circle and uh, back to the preoperative pathway, because you as the as aspiring surgeons need to be able to identify when the preoperative assessment is going to take place and who will perform that preoperative assessment. Now, in the case of that, of the elective patients, that can be quite nice and quite planned. And they can come to a preoperative clinic. And it's often led by advanced nurse practitioners and anaesthetists. And they can go through a lot of that information. Um, before they even see the surgeon or, or, or after they've seen the consultant in their, in their referral clinic.
But the key here is, and where you're probably going to be more involved as, as juniors aspiring to be cardiac surgeons, is, is managing those urgent patients. So you need to be aware of um, the investigations that are required and why they're required. You're likely to be requesting them, what they're looking for, how that impacts on the operation that they, they might need and how it impacts on the risk profile. So some of these investigations aren't needed because it changes anything to do with the operation. Pulmonary function tests, for example, doesn't change the nature of the operation, but it does change the risk profile. And if you've got an indication which is not, which is maybe a class two 2A, then you may look at the, that patient alongside the pulmonary function tests, which are pretty poor, and think, well, I'll I need to have a chat with my cardiology colleagues here because actually I can do an operation, but the best outcome for this patient might not be surgery. It may be a TAVI or it may be PCI. Um, and therefore, if you're getting those results back, and it's making you think, then you can escalate that through your appropriate channels to, to, to ask that question. It might not result in anything that might be happy. It might be acceptable. The patient may be all fine, but you need to be aware and understand why we're doing those things and, and what their importance is. Um, so I'll summarize there. Um, we've We've given a brief overview um, of the indications for surgery and um, that's a bit all encompassing. I expect you all to probably have to look back at that um, in a bit more detail, but I'd urge you to also look at the um, the raw guidelines on the Internet. Um, it spares me having made any typos. Um, and so we've co and we've covered that. Um, we've looked at then operability and I skimmed over the history and examination because I'm fully conscious that you're probably all aware of that. But we talked about the investigations. We've talked about some of the key investigations to how that guides your management plan and then how that impacts on your risk stratification and particularly the Euro 2, the Euro score 2, because that's the one we will use more frequently. And then ultimately what it boils down to is what is best for the patient and what does um, what does the patient want, which is what you're going to have to do on your operation um, but the only the closing thing that I wanted to say is as I'm sure some of you uh, are already aware but um, I'm also one of the co-leads for the cardiothoracic interdisciplinary research network uh, which is basically a body of trainees uh, consultant surgeons nurses allied health professionals um, who are all trying to help with um, widening the both involvement and uh, ability for the UK and Ireland to deliver national clinical trials across the uh, across the UK and Ireland. And um, there's the email account is on there. Um, drop me an email if you haven't already. It's good if you can be SCTS members, and um, because that helps with the GDPR and keeping your data in the cloud um, for us. But you, if you if you give permission in your email, then I, I like I can keep that as well, um, and that just allows us to get in touch with anybody um, as to where you're working and try and get you involved in any of these projects if you're interested. It's what I'm most interested in knowing is which hospital you're working in, um, what year of training you are, um, and if you've touched bases with the um, with the cardiac surgeons working locally for you. There is a mass of work that is just around the corner. Um, and so if you've got any uh, any questions or any interests about that, just let me know. Thank you for listening. <laughs>